And thanks to you at home for staying with us for this next hour. As always, I, I rely on Gail's love and support and that of our two lovely daughters. So I want to thank Ayla and Ariana for their help as well. And just, and just in case anybody who's watching throughout the country, yes, they're both available. No, no, no. Only kidding, only kidding. Ariana, Ariana definitely is not available, but Ayla is. What? Uh, this is Ariana. And this is Ayla. Well, I, I can see I'm going to get in trouble when I get home. And thus, Republican Senator-elect Scott Brown declared victory last night over the Democrat who would have been the first ever woman senator from Massachusetts. We will be talking to Michigan Democratic Senator Debbie Stabenow about the impact of that race in just a moment. But already, the election of Republican Scott Brown has created 100 new jobs in America because every single United States senator is now also moonlighting as a pundit. Uh, he ran a very smart campaign. He's a very, very good candidate. And he understood uh, the mood of the people of Massachusetts. They want us to, to stop the spending, stop the borrowing, and stop the health care bill. Some elections go your way. Some elections go the other way. It's the nature of democratic politics in a very diverse nation. Last night, a shot was fired around this nation. A shot was fired saying, no more business as usual in Washington, D.C. The American people have spoken. The people of Massachusetts have spoken for the rest of America. People of Massachusetts have spoken for the rest of America. Just like the people of New York 23 spoke for the rest of America when they put a Democrat in that House seat for the first time since the Civil War, right? Remember how that was for all of America back in November? Yeah, extrapolation fail. Uh, Democratic Congressman Barney Frank made headlines last night with a statement that essentially declared health reform dead in the wake of Scott Brown's election win in Massachusetts. Today, Congressman Frank reversed himself, saying, I have realized that my statement last night was more pessimistic than is called for. I was reacting, perhaps overreacting, to proposals I had heard from a variety of sources that we do things to facilitate the passage of a health care bill that would have sought in the short term to neutralize yesterday's election. I continue to believe that it will be difficult to get the Senate bill passed in the House as is without a commitment to making amendments in that bill that would be necessary to get the votes in the House. But I should not have indicated that I would be opposed to trying that as long as it was done with full regard for procedural fairness. So with that, I didn't really mean what I said yesterday. Statement, you can take Barney Frank out of the column of those who have reacted to last night's special election by advocating that the Democrats legislatively surrender in order to wring the maximum possible political benefit out of this one special election. Republicans have been describing that election as a revolution. The Scott heard around the world. And that makes total sense as Republicans spin, right? Obviously, they'd want to be able to say this wasn't a defeat of candidate Martha Coakley. This was a defeat of all Democrats. Of course, Republicans would spin it that way. And many masochistic Democrats like to think of it that way, too. Mm, losing. Past the spin, though, um, here's what remains. Democrats have gone from having the largest majority in the Senate since Watergate to having the second largest majority in the Senate since Watergate. They've gone from 60 seats to 59. In April, after Arlen Specter switched parties, the Democrats had 59 seats in the Senate. Today, factoring in the new senator-elect, they also have 59 seats in the Senate. So obviously, this is the end of the world. Even without 60 senators now, Democrats still have giant majorities in both the House and the Senate. And the question is what they're going to do with those majorities now that they don't have their magical, mythical unicorn to play with anymore. We had a really good time making that today. 
on paper after Al Franken was finally certified as winning in Minnesota. Democrats had a filibuster-proof 60-seat majority. On paper, that's what they had. But in reality, those 60 votes included a bunch of senators who really had no interest in voting with the rest of the Democrats on much of anything. Their little unicorn, their little myth of 60 reliable votes, led the Democrats to draft policies in a way that they thought maybe could get all of those 60 votes. Instead of working on the most effective possible policies that could still get a majority vote, Democrats have been throwing lassos at this mythical beast, trying to find the perfect, most conservative possible, but still theoretically democratic solutions to every problem in order to earn these 60 votes that they'd love to believe are theirs. And in trying to accommodate guys like Joe Lieberman and Ben Nelson and Evan Bayh, they came up with watered-down Republican light policies that were, frankly, less effective. Hello, smaller stimulus, just for the sake of being smaller. Remember that? The way that you build political momentum is not just by having attractive individual candidates. It's by winning. And it's not just by winning elections, but by being associated with winning policies. Politics and policy are two different things, but they are linked things. By winning elections, you get the ability to affect policy. By affecting good policy, you win more elections. And hitting the 60-vote threshold made Democrats worse at policy. It made them think they could lasso this unicorn. They could get every Democrat on board and still maintain good policy, even when some of those Democrats found it to be in their political interest to just say no to everything in order to be seen as kind of a Republican-ish type of Dem. And that unicorn is now gone after last night's special election. And, and the choice for Democrats is either to throw up their hands and say, well, the Republicans say we need 60 votes for everything, so I guess we can't ever do anything now. Or they can say, hey, we've got 59 votes. It's not filibuster proof, so let's not continue to concede that for the first time in American history, every single vote of consequence in the United States Senate will be subject to a filibuster and will take 60 votes. Either get rid of the filibuster because it's being abused in a way that it never has been before. Look at that chart. Or at least change the rules of the filibuster. Or pass everything through reconciliation where you need 51 votes and not 60. There are limitations to that, but it's not like big policies don't pass this way. That's what President Bush did with his tax cuts in 2001. Passed through reconciliation with 58 votes. Bush's tax cuts in 2003 passed through reconciliation with 51 votes. The Deficit Reduction Act of 2005, which reduced spending on Medicaid, passed through reconciliation with 51 votes. You don't have to get 60 votes every time. And now that 60 isn't even theoretically possible, with Republicans pledging to vote no always on everything, now that the mythical unicorn of the 60-seat majority is gone, it's time for Democrats to choose a path forward. Either quit and let the party with 41 votes control the agenda, or fight with 59 votes and give people a reason to vote for you again. Joining us now is Democratic Senator Debbie Stabenow of Michigan. Senator Stabenow, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Really appreciate your time. Sure, Rachel. It's great to be with you. Let me ask you, in the, in the big picture, um, how extrapolatable you think the results are of last night's special election. Is that election uh, something that has a national message for Democrats? Um, and if so, what is that message? Well, I think that it would be wrong to assume that it was only Massachusetts. I think there are larger issues. And I think the big question for folks is the fact that people are still hurting in this country. Um, we saw eight years of uh, a, a Republican Congress moving us into a deficit ditch and millions, millions of jobs lost and moving us in the wrong direction. A new president comes in with tremendously high hopes, a new Congress. We've been working very, very hard, but frankly, there's still still a lot left to do, and things have not turned as quickly as we would like, even passing the Recovery Act and expanding children's health insurance, equal pay, mortgage relief, credit cards, FDA tobacco reform. I mean, frankly, to be honest, in the first year of this uh, president, we have passed a tremendous amount of legislation. But to go to the heart of what people are concerned about, they're still worried about their job. They may have a job, but will they keep it? Their health care costs? 
costs are continuing to go up, which is why we need to pass health care reform. Uh, out-of-pocket costs for them, they're getting squeezed on every side. And so people are feel, feeling great anxiety. And I understand that. And that's something that we all need to understand and need to be laser focused on jobs, turning around the economy, and addressing the pocketbook issues that families are struggling with today. Well, on those substantive issues, on jobs, and I know there's going to be legislation, probably a lot of legislation, addressing jobs issues early in the year, on the financial services right. industry reform, on the issue of health care, of course. There's right. been a lot of breathless commentary over the past 24 hours about how last night's special election somehow means the end of the Democrats' agenda. Obviously, you are articulating a policy agenda that you think will work electorally for Democrats, but what about how to get it passed? Do you think Democrats should be reassessing how you are going about passing legislation? Well, Rachel, you raise several good points, but let me also add that uh, as much as I would love to change this 60-vote rule and filibuster rule, it takes two-thirds of the Senate to be able to do that. So that's not realistic for us. We can use uh, this reconciliation process you talked about uh, for some things, as, uh, but not for everything. It can be done in a limited way, and 